The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Generation Life Limited, ABN 68092 843902, AFSL 225 408, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Listening to Strategies to Facilitate Intergenerational Wealth Transfers, a special five part mini series from the Ensemble Podcast. Over five episodes, we talk to authors, practitioners, product providers, and a lawyer to reveal what works and what doesn't for advisors and their clients when it comes to retiring and leaving a legacy. As the pioneer of Australia's first truly flexible investment bond, Generation Life has been at the forefront of providing innovative, tax-effective investment solutions since 2004. As an innovation-led business, Generation Life constantly strives to enhance investment solutions to optimise after-tax investment performance for investors. As a leading specialist provider of tax-optimised investment and estate planning solutions, as well as investment-linked lifetime annuities, Generation Life works closely with financial advisors to secure the financial futures of many Australians and their families. Hello and welcome back to this special XY Advisor podcast mini-series focused on the retirement income covenant and its implications for advisors. I'm Finn Scully, veteran advisor and founder of LifeSherpa, Australia's most affordable financial advice service. In today's episode, we talk to a couple of advisors doing great things in their businesses. In these sessions, we chatted about their businesses in general and specifically how they're using investment bonds and annuities to improve the lives of their clients. My first guest is Les McGuire of Future Proof Wealth, operating under the Fortnum Wealth Licence and based in Ballina, New South Wales. Les is a 2008 graduate of the AMP Horizons program and was named one of Barron's Australian Top 100 Financial Advisors in 2020. His practice focuses mainly on retirees and higher income earners. Welcome, Les. I'm a big believer in looking at um, strategy being the underlying driver for every person's best outcomes. So it's not about products. It's about what um, are the the right investment underlying structures to put people into better positions. And so in that regard, um, that's where, for instance, I've utilised, for instance, investment bonds and various structures for clients to enable incredible tax efficiencies, asset protection, wealth creation, succession planning mechanisms to be able to ensure the clients of all different wealth dyna- dynamics, you know, can be best set up not only for them while they're alive, but also for their estates in the future. Because that's very important to a lot of clients when they really understand what estate structures are out there and how best they can be leveraged. Because unfortunately, many people believe a will is, you know, write a will and everything's okay. Well, that's incorrect. So how can we best as advisors educate clients yes. around having the appropriate structures to ensure that, you know, their wealth when they pass, regardless of what that wealth is, can move to their family um, how they wish it to. And that's where an investment bonds, et cetera, have been an incredible introduction into our business for clients because it provides such an extra layer of protection, but still in a very a tax effective environment. Yeah, so it's it's interesting that you should talk about investment bonds because that's a whole a market that's changed a lot over the last um, twenty or thirty years, especially in the last five. So you obviously don't have quite as much grey hair as I do, but if you go back to the early nineties when the top marginal rate of forty nine percent cut in at um, fifty thousand dollars of taxable income, and bonds were primarily used for tax e- efficiency. Mm-hmm. You know, roll forward through the um, the Costello and um, Howard reforms. We've now got a top marginal rate that cuts in at one hundred and eighty thousand dollars. So about three percent of taxpayers are top marginal rate payers. So the the tax argument is much less critical for a large chunk of the population. So talk to me about how how you use investment bonds and like perhaps uh, an example of how how you've used it for the benefit of some of your categories of clients? Yeah, look, I, I suppose there's quite a number of reasons that we use investment bonds. Um, 
one of which is yes, in that higher net worth income earning space, they can work um, incredibly effective. However, what's really important to note is, and whilst the actual tax rate or the assumed tax rate from the ATO on the investment bonds is thirty percent, re- reality says that if you're in the right investment bond structure using the right investment bond provider, and in our case we use um, Generation Life as our um, you know, key provider that we actually use. And the reason being is, and I've done a lot of work in that space because they've got some really tax effective um, internal options where with rebates, et cetera, the actual real tax rate, you know, can be quite a lot lower than 30% after rebates, et cetera. So it's critically important when you're thinking about it from a client's perspective do you look at what the net result at the end is, not just looking at what that notional sort of um, number is? Because that can play a massive difference in many people's lives and in, in environments. Because even when people, you know, are, you know, earning above, yeah, you know, eighty or you know, plus thousand dollars a year, and then moving, you know, towards that mid twenties and so forth, if you've got the actual rich tax or taxable rate within those bonds, let's say. Yeah, we've got quite a few around that 13 and 14 percent yeah it's still providing a really great benefit overall but we sort of turn take that back and think about what's our key objective well depending on the client's age they could be a young professional they um you know from their strategy point of view they want to be able to have a, a really great um tax affected in- investment strategy in place, they might be a professional, they could be a lawyer, they could be somebody who wants to make sure that their assets are re- relatively safe, you know, with what they do as well. They might be self employed. When we start to look at investment bonds, there's so many more benefits because they sit under the life insurance act. You know, there's so much protection around, you know, if people bankruptcy protection, you know, people try to sue you. Um, you know, we've got there's there's lots of asset protection mechanisms in a bond that provide really great outcomes there. But also from a taxable perspective, we well, imagine that we commence one of these for a young professional at 25, they're earning $120,000 a year, let's call it. They're obviously contributing to super as well alongside that as part of their strategy, but super whilst a long-term retirement objective, they've got to wait until they're 65 plus to even get access to that money. So then when we pull it back and we go, well, what are these other... Um, and as you said, as an example, or some of the examples, the perfect one was an engineer. Yeah, he's in his late forties, um, wife's mid forties. Uh, we're looking at wanting to retire at um, the age of he wants to retire at sixty. He wants to be on a you know, significant income. Ultimately, she that means she'll be retiring at about fifty eight, fifty seven. So we set up a bond for them, um, an investment bond. We've got a, so an investment, investment bond, and the superstructure. The investment's going to be able to come into play when she turns 58, right? The investment bond will t- kick in after that for them because of the after 10 years, 10 plus years, obviously it's going to be tax free with whatever we've generated within that bond. And then the super can tip in at a later stage. So ultimately, it can become a really awesome mechanism to provide a multi layered strategy approach to achieve great outcomes for clients, you know, because once you maximize your super, what else do you do with your money, let's call it, if that super is the best tax strategy to use? So then investment bonds tailoring inside and alongside that can work incredibly powerfully, regardless of the client's age. I had a client, yeah, I had a really difficult, uh, she's unfortunately passed, but she had a really difficult um, estate planning need and or, you know, uh, something she wanted to solve. Um, she had a daughter who passed away, predeceased her. Uh, she had a son who's also a client of mine, and a um, a daughter. But she had some grandchildren <laughs> of the the daughter who had predeceased her, and she really wanted to make sure that her grandchildren could get some of the estate, or the at least the the portion of the estate that was you know ruled initially to her daughter who had passed. Now the investment loan structure for for her, given that. Um, you know, estate planning wishes and needs and so forth provide an incredible outcome because the investment bonds themselves structured correctly are like a testamentary arrangement in themselves. So it provided this incredible outcome in such sad, difficult circumstances where, um, you know, if she's looking down on upon us today, her, her grandchildren 
in a estate arrangement that otherwise could have been contested was free of contestation because of the way and the beautiful way that the investment bonds work in the estate planning world. So when we think about investment bonds, it's not just about investments. It's not just about taxation. It's not just about earnings. It's actually so much more. And that's why when I love to look at bonds, I'm thinking about those critical measures around and often things that are done very badly, unfortunately, um, in the world of legal and, and advice where estate planning is so critical. So so all advisors should be really considering and educating clients, especially where there are estate planning needs, to be considering these instruments as part of that strategy. And when we take you back to what you said before, Vince, was um, in regards to the taxation and where they can fit in, given that obviously the, you know, the fire, you know to be in that fire tax bracket, you're earning more. Again, you know, I think, and to touch on what I said earlier, that the internal tax uh, rebates and so forth that are offered within certain investment environments, like what Generation Light um, offer, provide incredible benefits and significant benefits for clients there. So you can have at various ages for clients um, arrangements that will mature after 10 years and be tax free. So if someone's investing at 25, let's call it by the time they're 36, that investment, regardless of the earnings, is completely tax free. They might still be self-employed. We leave it within the bond to continue. We can start other bonds so it's staggered approach. So we've always got access to capital in the future if we want, but we can leave it within so the, state and the investment bond structure for protection and further growth tax-free after 10 years. I was asked to present at a Gen Life luncheon in Brisbane with a, with a room full of advisors at Victoria Park and the feedback after it was quite extraordinary with people coming up and talking to me where they didn't understand you know the usage of bonds and how they can be best applied to better a client's position because many people just think about it in you know merely linear sense and that is client earns over this much earns over 30 cents in the dollar we put it in here they pay less tax well you know what that is thinking with a really minimal sort of um uh, yeah, a line of thought when you think about the way that things can be best leveraged for a client. And when you're looking at broadly the strategy, what are all those needs? And it's not, like I said, it's, it's the 30%, um, unless you really understand how these things work, um, can really do many clients an injustice by not having these things, by having investment bonds recommended as part of their strategy where it could be more beneficial in many instances. I've got clients that often now grandparents are setting them up for the grandkids because mum and dad might be in a position necessarily um, to put money away but the grandparents you know might have quite a bit of money so we're setting them up and yeah you know, we've worked out in one case that uh, <laughs> loving it um ex the you know, retired engineer of mine um been a long-term client and now he's got seven grandchildren and every time there's another grandchildren i work out this spreadsheet to work out so little johnny and hannah up here and whatever all are going to end up on the same trajectory so working out all the numbers so that it's all going to flow through fairly at the end of the day so when they hold it sure it's going to be rich and with fair so you, you're trying to make sure that being born first doesn't give you an unfair advantage so essentially um it's it's quite but for, for him it gives um terence a real sense of um, yeah, a proud grandparent was because he's able to help to contribute towards his grandchildren to where in 10 years' time, you know, after the oldest, let's call it, and then working from there, um, it, it puts it into a position where, um, you know, well, he can, let's call it, let's say the eldest is now 14. Um, oh, no, sorry, four. So it would be 14 when it, it matures. We then hold that off and we keep that bond going with a maturity date that, yeah, potentially 18 for university or it could be 14 so it can kick into private school fees and all those sorts of things. So, um, you know, so, so there are so many uses for the bonds. So if we can now, now move on a little bit and talk a little bit about the retirement income challenge, you know, one of the uh, challenges with, um, and I'm not sure if you see this in your practice, but it's certainly a story I hear a lot from other advisors that we spend, that those of us who work mostly with accumulated clients are so used to hearing the message, you know, spending bad, saving, investing good. And when people start to retire, 
um, the difficulty of moving to actually now spending good, just not too much, and actually encouraging people to spend some of their principal as well um, so that we don't necessarily end up with people scrooping and saving to um, end up dying with more than they retired with. Um, how do you deal with that in your, in your in your practice? I've got this funny little saying with, with clients, um, and it worked really well. It happened, the f- first time I used it was probably about five years or they're about to go because I had a client who was really, really worried, and they had like, oh, they're still with me, and they're two plus me, mm. but they were scared to spend them, just scared to spend them. So what I did, I introduced a little saying, you know, as simple as it is, I call it my per- my permission. I give them my permission for them to spend, and it was quite amazing with the way that they um, accepted what I said. There was incredible. Where they said, "Oh, so is it okay?" And I said, "It was like I become the parent to my client because I'm giving them <laughs> permission." And it was really funny. So I'm making a little bit of a joke about it now with certain clients, where I use that as a little bit of a, um, a tagline analogy around. I want to make sure that you understand that whilst this is always your money, I as your advisor will make sure that financially you're going to be okay and to ensure that you feel comfortable with being able to spend money and do things and enjoy your life, I will make sure I give you permission to spend. Mm-hmm. And it is incredible the way that the clients, um, that they seem to love it because all of a sudden it's like that I'm empowering them to be able to know that they're going to be okay. Mm. And then I usually say, depending again on who the client is, I say, but if you ask me for money for a Porsche every year, you're probably going to get some really serious pushbacks. <laughs> and, and it's really cool because clients then get the feeling between, you know, the the ability to spend but then being sensible about their retirement journey right so being able to make sure and i often talk about wouldn't it be really super cool that if on your last day that you decide to be on earth and you're taking your last breath that you had that last dollar that you're buying something with that last dollar to go right i'm done and so really again they get the concept of that they that it is their money like because what i do is i talk about I often bring my children into the scenario, I've got six daughters, and I often talk about if I died today and my wife died today, our kids would walk away with, yeah, reasonably decent inheritance. However, I often say to the kids, by the time I plan on dying, you kids all should be married, they should have kids, they should be, yeah, I've worked hard or, you know, or um, whatever it be. So you shouldn't need mum and dad's money because you should be doing it all yourself, right? Mm-hmm. And so and and so what I tell my clients is I said, you know, if you've been and you've empowered your kids to do the right thing, which I'm sure you have, and they go, yeah. And I said, well, wouldn't it be great if now all the hard work that you've put in you can actually enjoy? And no doubt there's going to be a house left over or there'll be something left over so you don't ever have to worry about providing for but enjoy, uh, worry about how to enjoy every last day you have. And it's amazing, again, from that psychology perspective, it just turns the tables where people start to then uh, feel like they have ownership over their own money. And I think that's the problem. I think often people, um, because it works so hard in their life, and as you're working, you're paying bills, you're trying to survive and you're trying to get ahead, and all of a sudden you're retiring because some people have varying levels of wealth, you know, I think for them it's it it's becomes this real fear around spending because of they're not getting that income to replace it. So being able to show them, um, and depending on what structures, again, investment bonds or super or whatever, how that works for them in reality, I think it gives them a lot of strength around that too to you know, provide better outcomes. When we you think about retirement income and the way to provide income certainty, this is where often now annuities is playing quite a part in that space as well. And there's some various annuities, like there's the old interest bearer ones that you lock in, and and obviously they've been out of favour for quite some time because interest rates have been so low. So it's, you know, you're locking away clients' money below inflation for a long period of time. Or now, for instance, with a generation like they've got 
where you're actually able to invest that money and actually get that money to work. So ideally, again, as an advisor, you know, you can never put your hand up to say that we're always going to you know, get everything right, but at the same time as you're investing that money sensibly for a client and you're investing it over the longer term and we're getting some growth on that money, it is helping to provide that good sustainable income into the future. And I think that's a real key dynamic now with the annuity space, especially with, again, Gen Y and what they're doing, is it's providing other ways to um, what I would call have sexy annuities where advisors actually can be really involved and help a client achieve better outcomes along the way. Yeah, I mean, you raise a whole bunch of very interesting points there. Um, so as, as you say, you know, Australians, at least for the last decade or so, have been reluctant to buy lifetime annuities or fixed lifetime or index lifetime annuities because interest rates have been so low and equities have done pretty well. You know, I think when we look back on at least the 2010 to 2020 decade, um, you know, that will stick out as being a period of relatively high real investment returns, particularly on equities. Um, and so Australians were very reluctant to, as you say, lock away money. And we saw innovations around trying to create liquidity and um, yeah, non-zero residual values. But um, that psyche of Australians being you know, very keen to leave a legacy and so being reluctant to lock away significant chunks of their assets to generate a guaranteed inflation-proof income, albeit a relatively low one. So obviously being able to get some market upside is a helps, goes a long way to removing that reluctance. Um, so how do you help clients understand that trade-off between absolute certainty of income and the market upside that you're giving away in a way that's understandable? To answer your question the best way, like when, when I want to explain about um, introducing income in an annuity form, for instance, to a client, it becomes far more strategic than just going, oh, let's just put an annuity so you've got this income. So what it could be, depending on their situation, is by implementing or introducing an annuity, plus having you know some you know, capital assets, let's say in super or whatever over here. So we've got access to some of that capital, which can provide an income and pension. We've got an annuity. All of a sudden, we're starting opening up a, another door to potentially settling. You know, all of a sudden, we're we're opening up this door to potentially. You know, aged care benefits that otherwise wouldn't have been because of the such favourable treatment with annuities with only 60% obviously counted under the assets test. So essentially all of a sudden by uh, strategically looking at them um, from a more comprehensive strategy perspective, there's so many opportunities that we can start to open up for clients, whether it be day one. So there's clients that you know, have introduced annuities into their lives where I said to them in the statement of advice and the projections, by year three, they'd start getting the age pension where otherwise they wouldn't have. And then all of a sudden, that's just ramped up. And our client the other day, she's 82. She's been a long-term client of mine. She comes in, she sits down, and she had a daughter and son with her because we're doing some you know, pre-potentially moving into aged care space. And the one thing about for her that was just that's just puts a smile on her face every day is how... I was able to, because I recommended introducing annuities into her life, was able to help her achieve the age pension. And that was the holy grail for her. And she's still got hundreds of thousands of dollars over here, you know, in other pensions, et cetera. But she's getting this age pension. And the age pension for her, even if she got $1, but she's getting something like 8000 bucks a year, she's so blown away by that. It's like the rest of the world doesn't matter. <laughs> but... To achieve that outcome for her, the annuity, the annuities in her case played a beautiful um, role in achieving that outcome. So the amount of people out there, the problem is they just don't understand from an advice perspective where the annuity can fit in. Because if you think about the annuity, um, and even assuming if the market, you know, invested in the market and the market was flat for argument's sake. So let's just say there wasn't a lot of up 
side growth in the income for a period there. But all of a sudden, it meant we got age pension, right? Because otherwise, they wouldn't have because they're over the assets test. And all of a sudden, by getting them that, if you think about then the uptick on the percentage of return on that annuity because of that, how that's created the ability to get the age pension, all of a sudden, that return itself is looking far better. Plus the all the other ancillary benefits, you know, the car regos, all the other health things that go with it. So I like to be honest think broadly that um, if, if more people um, understood the benefits of being able to utilise, yeah, again, investment bonds and annuities are part of their life, they'd be financially far better off. Les McGuire, thank you for joining us on the XY Podcast. That was Les McGuire of Future Proof Wealth. My next guest is Michael Bova, founder and managing director of Family Wealth Advisory based on Sydney's Lower North Shore. Michael specialises in providing advice to high income earners, business owners and high net worth families on investment and wealth management. Michael, tell us a little bit about how you help your clients. And so if we can take the financial stress away <laughs> and take that cloud away and they've got clarity of, oh, okay, this is what I can do if there's no financial stress and sort of set them free. So if we can do that, then we feel like, okay, we, we, we've sort of done our job. The family businesses we like because um, it ticks a lot of strategy boxes and I, one of my core values is I love to learn. <laughs> so I love learning about strategies and how we can help. So the thing with family business, I guess, different to an employee is you've got, I guess, some concerns around asset protection. So asset protection definitely becomes uh, quite a, an important part of their overall strategies. Um, dovetails into the estate planning, which is you know, ensuring that the asset protection survives the um, the person that passes. Uh, and then you've got the complexity around cash flow. So an employee receives cash. It's hard enough to try and make them save. I'm, I'm sure you know that, Vince. Yeah, that's, uh, that's our core business here. Yep. Sure. So we're very good at helping clients get control of that cash flow. Um, so we do work with some high income earning accumulators where they've got enough savings where we can work with. But in the family business space, there's an extra discipline because you've got to get the cash out. <laughs> so not only you've got to get the discipline of the savings, because so many family businesses just love to reinvest, reinvest, reinvest. Uh, so we teach them the discipline of um, firstly, take the cash out. And then once we've convinced them to take some of the cash out um, to build sort of a passive wealth around them, part of that setting themselves financially free and taking the stress out of the business is how do we do that? And so there's the complexity around what's the most tax effective way to get it out of either the PTY limited company, the unit trust, the family trust, whatever it is. So we work very closely with their accountants to, to minimize tax leakage on the, yep. on the way through. And then where does it end up? So where, where does that cash end up? Does it end up in their hands, in another family trust, in a company, what super funds? And so once we've worked the plumbing out and locked the plumbing down, then we just focus on continuing to pull the cash through that. Mm -hmm. So most of the family businesses we are looking at are, are, are quite profitable and mm -hmm. um, are showing quite a strong profit. So um, they'll be drawing out and living their lifestyle. So we don't get in there and really change their lifestyle too much. If there's excess cash that's just disappearing and the lifestyle's not really improving, we'll capture that. Yep. Good. But we won't change their lifestyle. I've learned that lesson. Um, and they'll be funding that lifestyle either through um, salaries, director's fees, dividends. That we sort of leave yep. alone. There, there is an art to whether it comes out of salaries or dividends and, and all of that, but that's more in the accounting space. Mm -hmm. Once the lifestyle's been fully funded, that generally gives them the income to do the, um, uh, you know, service the debt with the bank. Um, now, if there were businesses out there that weren't sort of um, pulling salaries, then yes, some of those individuals would probably struggle. But that typically hasn't been hasn't been our client base. That intergenerational moving from mum and dad retiring to one or more of the kids coming in to take over or bringing in professional management mm -hmm. at that point um, creates a um, a need for a change in mindset to move from. This is probably not the words that your client base will use, but when you know, I told my client base, we talk about moving from accumulation where you're thinking spending bad, saving good, to retirement where you've got to get into the actually spending good, just not too much, and to accept that you will erode some of the capital of your remaining retirement life. That creates a bunch of challenges in business where the business may have a continuing appetite for capital. And how do you balance the income for the retiring generation with the income for the younger generation? You know, having having the matriarch there or the patriarch there 
putting a plan in place for the next generation so that there is a bit of an equity build, uh -huh. making sure to your point that uh, mum and dad are still looked after financially because sometimes they might want to gift it down, but maybe they need uh -huh. the assets to sort of support them. Uh, we see that a little bit more in the farming space. Uh -huh. um, there's a little bit more of a the generation that comes up and through onto the farm can be quite concessional in terms of, of, of accumulating the assets. Um, so yeah, we work in in all of that space. Uh, so there's definitely a, an added layer of complexity to make sure that the succession plan works for both mum and dad and the and the generation coming through. Superannuation as a home uh, really ticks so many boxes. Asset protection really really strong. Uh, tax benefits of super pretty hard to beat. Uh, tax in retirement is great. Um, Thank you, Peter Costello. Yeah. So so super is a, a bit of a no-brainer. Also, in terms of getting money out of the business, we talked about the complexity of getting money out. Getting money out and into super on the on the deductible side is really clean. Yep. Very clean. So that's really efficient. Um, getting the non-concessionals in is, is a little bit more complex. Of course, concessionals only 27 and a half a year. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, maybe with this inflation running as hard as it is, I might, we might get a bump next year. So there's a small amount we can stream out that way. Um, so superannuation as a home definitely is... Um, is really good as a tool. Uh, if for the younger generation, the liquidity issues around it are, are obviously a, a major concern. So if you've got a plan to buy a home and a car and whatever's happening there, um, it's probably not something you'll accelerate through a bit later. But for those sort of 45, 50 onwards, it it's definitely ticks a lot of boxes. Once the super pot tends to be full, or if you're hitting your concessional limits and you can't get more in every year, that's when we start to see the fallback strategies of either, as you mentioned, um, some people use a bucket company. <laughs> There's the disadvantages there. I mean, obviously, I'm not allowed to give um, tax advice, but uh, the disadvantages in the PTY Limited is you don't get the CGT discount. Yeah. Um, and then once you start to pull the money out, you potentially have top-up tax on top of that. Um, family trusts are really good. Tick a lot of boxes around asset protection, flexibility in terms of streaming both income and capital. So they're a great intergenerational tool as well. And they do get the, the discretionary family trusts get the benefit of the CGT discount, which is really, really good. The challenge with the family trust is that the income has to be distributed every year. Otherwise, they get taxed at yep. a pretty nasty tax rate. So they need to find a home for it. And that's where the bucket companies typically come in. Because if the marginal is at 47 and you can stream it into a company at 30. 29. Yeah. So you're saving yourself uh, some, some tax that way. But the problem is it's a temporary. It's a timing issue mm -hmm. because you're just parking it. You're deferring tax. And then when you rip the money back out, you've got the top up tax and you haven't really achieved much. Um, and there's no CGT discount in there. So the bucket companies always typically tended to create challenges because then people will raid the, the company, create these Division 7A loans, and they're already kicking it further down the road. And then the ATO want interest back on that loan, and it, it just all gets very complicated. What it's creating is a, is a temporary nebulous yeah. around where's the cash. So when we That's talk about cash flow sits at the heart, what we want to know for our clients is what is the cash after all tax, after all these complications that is available for lifestyle? Like real money. Go and spend it. What is the cash that's available for your next holiday home or whatever it is? Okay, great. We've got that provision for. And where is the cash for long-term wealth building? And the problem with the Div 7As and some of those strategies is people's robbing Peter to pay Paul and there's money going over here and it's money that's got to go back into the company at some point and which, which part of that cash flow is. So... And keeping track of it is, yeah, it's a mental challenge that I found a lot of, not a lot of clients are actually up to keeping their head around that. Yeah. And the, dis the big shift you get between real cash and what I'm eventually going to have to give the tax man on this becomes a... Yeah. And that tax bill, if it's in the mail and coming, that's what, a, that's what annoys clients. So what we, we take a lot of that tax pain away. One, obviously we work with great tax advisors to make sure that the tax is minimised, but even when we know the tax is coming, because you can't avoid tax, it's just part of society. If you provision for the tax properly and you park the cash, you, know, you can still run a treasury yeah. function and get a good return on it. But if you've got the cash when the tax bill comes, you don't really hate tax as much. It's when the tax bill comes and you've spent the money on lifestyle, that's when you start to go, oh, I hate taxes, I yes. hate taxes. Um, so, so the bucket company is a, is a good temporary solution. It, it typically used to be used a lot. Um, a lot of accounts would tend to stream that, that, just, that income from the trust up to the trustee company as the bucket company or, or even a separate mm. bucket company. Um, Pre-CGT, it was an absolute winner of a strategy. Yeah, pre-CGT, that were good days. And then so what we're looking for is, okay, so what's another strategy? So um, one thing we're seeing some of the accountants do is bucket companies are becoming more functional. So instead of a, a, a just a timing issue, potentially become a more of a permanent issue. 
So if you sort of build up wealth within the company, which you will use to fund you in retirement, you haven't got any other accessible income. So when you start to pull some of those fully frank dividends out in retirement without any other accessible income, there's, you're avoiding the top-up tax. So in that case, it could actually be a permanent tax savings between that 30% and the um, 47 um, But that's if you're in a point where that makes sense and your super's full. So if you've got a full super, you've capped out your super and you might sort of um, draw on your bucket company first and then start to draw on your tax-free super, potentially that might be a solution. But another solution that we found in terms of what to do with that distributable income in the family trust is using something like a, an insurance bond or an investment yeah. bond. Um, so how are you using those, Michael? Uh, so if you've got the capital in the family trust, um, let's say you've got, uh, let's just pick, pick a number. Let's say you've got a million dollars sitting in a family trust. Um, if you- so This is trust corpus. Yeah, corpus. So if you've got the capital that's in there, um, you can either invest it directly in the family trust, it'll generate that income and that income has to be streamed somewhere. So they've got to distribute that to a beneficiary every year. Alternatively, you can put the million dollars into an investment bond that the family trust owns and the income generated from that investment will be held within the bond structure. A tax will be paid within the bond structure and it never comes back out to the family trust. So the family trust, the trustee of the family trust hasn't got that issue at the end of the year in terms of, okay, um, who do I stream this income to? How do we minimize the tax? Because there's nothing streaming through. So if you had the ability to stream income to people um, or entities at less than 30% tax, then maybe the investment bond doesn't make sense. But if you're streaming income through to beneficiaries who are paying more than 30%, then this is a great way to park that cash. You're not getting the income you need to distribute and it's sitting in that that nice protected environment. Yeah, and it's interesting you talk about streaming income. I mean, one of the things that I talk to a lot of my peers about um, with adult children at uni, you go, well, you got the choice, you can pay 39% of it to the tax office or you can give 100% of it to your kids. Which do you want to do? <laughs> and that's really interesting because they used to distribute, and I probably still do, income to the children and then have the children give them the money back. And now Section 100A of the Tax Act has now, um, it's always been there, but now they're shining a light on it saying, if that cash doesn't stay with the child and it's not actually used for the child, then we don't see that as an actual distribution. And and so so that's putting a lot of pressure now on some of those uh, trustee distributions come year end. So So how much do you love your adult children? (laughs) That's right. Probably a bit easier if they're at uni or school and and you could probably justify that the distribution was used to fund their actual education expenses. But without that, yeah, the, the the gift back through love and affection, I think that's it's getting more problematic. So getting back to the investment bond in the trust for a moment, so we're, you're saying that we take trust corpus and we invest it in a investment insurance bond, whatever we call them these days, or friendly society bonds, and that corpus stays in the investment bond potentially forever. Correct. And the income never turns up on the trust's net trust income. Correct. And even if we do cash it in post year 10, we don't have any taxable income in the trust. That's right. So if you hold it through the 10 year rule and you um, pull the income back in to the trust, um, you haven't got that sort of any potential top up tax issues. Um, so I guess a couple of the advantages of, of doing it. One is it stops the income having to be distributed when you've got beneficiaries above 30% tax. So that, that's a good win. Some of the bonds, so we tend to use uh, Generation Life, Mm -hmm. and uh, they use some tax-optimized strategies within the bonds. So the bond will pay a top tax rate of 30%, and if you pull the money out before the 10-year rule, you get a 30% credit, so it's not like it's wasted tax. It is a non-refundable offset. Yes. So you need income to cover it. Yeah. And so you're paying tax in the bond at 30%. But you can run a tax optimized mandate within mm-hmm. there, and Generation Life uh, tend to do quite a, um, uh, some good ones mm-hmm. in there. And uh, so your tax rate may come down to as low as twenty percent, fifteen percent, probably even lower than that with some of their really tax optimized strategies. But if you can now start to get your tax rate down to let's call it twenty percent, um, that tax differential between what was ultimately the beneficiary and staying in the bond is starting to make a lot of sense. And then after ten years, if you pull the money back you haven't got any of those potential top-up tax issues. Um, uh, so we got the trust owning the bond. What about the insured life? Yeah, so the, the insured life uh, is still a function of the bond. 
So you can nominate um, who is the person that's going to be insured. You don't have to have an insurable interest. <laughs> so it could be anybody. Um, normally, once you set up within the family trust structure, so if we're doing an investment bond uh, for an individual, yeah. we'll always name a beneficiary yeah. and we might use them as a bit of a de facto family trust or as a de facto testamentary trust because you can have a future transfer event um, and let's say it's it's to go to a minor beneficiary and you don't want them to have the capital until they're 25. You put that as the future transfer event when mum or dad pass. So that's nice and clean. Once the bond is owned by the family trust, you lose the future transfer event capability, functionality in the bond because the capital has to go back to the family trust. You can't stream it to someone that wasn't the family trust. But you can sort of a death beneficiary. Yeah, so let's say you nominated uh, Joe Blocks yep. as the life insured with the bond owned by the family trust. If Joe Bloggs passed, the bond would then pay that capital back into the family trust. But what you would normally do is you would have, say, two or three life insured on the on the policy within the family trust. So if one of them passes, it goes tax-free, but you're not forced to cash that bond in. And you can either pull that capital back or it just gives you that sort of flexibility so that it doesn't totally collapse. So just, just tease that out for the moment. You're saying that the death of one of the nominated beneficiaries effectively accelerates the 10-year rule for the entire value of the bond. Correct. That's an interesting thought. So in the context of a family trust, that point we've accelerated the 10-year rule, so all my income is now tax-free or tax-paid, but I don't have the obligation to cash it in until the final life. Got two more life. So yeah, you've got a cascading um, mm-hmm. strategy there. So, um, so yeah, you might have an elderly grandparent on there as one of the, if you, if in terms of trying to go to the tax free a bit earlier. Um, uh, so that gives you the flexibility. You lose some of that future event functionality once you go into the family trust. So, as I said, if you owned it individually, you can really say, right, well, when my child is 25, they can have access to $50,000 a year. And when they're 35, they can have the whole thing. So it's a great estate planning tool. In the family trust, you do give up a bit of that. But as I mentioned, there is those strategies where you can put in place that sort of can at least give you some flexibility. So the trustee of the trust, upon that passing, can either pull the capital back, leave it there. And presumably even when the capital does go back to the trust, you could still do a distribution of corpus to a beneficiary, assuming your trustee allowed you to. Correct. So you don't really lose access to the capital. And you can stream it to them. They might even go set up an individual one. Um, you can always transfer ownership of the bond at any time. There's no real taxing event. Obviously, a family trust selling corpus across to somebody else, there's probably a taxing event at the family trust level, but at the investment bond level, um, you can transfer ownership of an investment bond without sort of triggering any tax inside the bond. So, so your strategy is ready to say, okay. if I transfer this amount of trust capital into a bond... I take that income out of the trust, the net trust estate, or the net trust income, and I don't have to report it until I actually receive it. And if I receive it post year 10, it's a non-taxable receipt. So my trust corpus has gone up, but I haven't actually had to pay tax on that increment, other than there's tax been paid inside the bond along the way. Correct. So as long as that's less than the beneficiary who would have otherwise had it streamed, then I'm I'm ahead. Absolutely. And of course, I've got all those other benefits along the way. But, um... So the, the, generally, the higher you go up in the families with the, the, the net worth, the you, the you tend to cap out the um, adult beneficiaries over 18 who aren't really working and you used to be able to stream mm-hmm. and now we've got Section 100A to deal with. So you used to have those. Then you had the bucket company and then that sort of cap you at 30%. Uh, here, so if you had flexibility to stream and, and get distributions uh, two beneficiaries less than 30%, then this strategy really probably doesn't make a lot of sense. But once that's all capped out, um, this makes sense from a definitely from a tax savings point of view, um, but also just control of the capital. Um, and having it inside the family trust probably just gives you that added layer of flexibility and protection. I mean, you can own the bond as an individual and still have great asset protection. Mm. Uh, what you lose is the ability that when you pass away, you can nominate who the beneficiaries are um, so that's kind of a bit like a family trust in that you can sort of make some decisions around that. But the great thing about a family trust is once the capital comes back into the family trust, you've got that full flexibility in terms of uh, at that time, who do you want to distribute it to? So I guess that's the distinction between distributing the corpus to an individual and having the individual buy the bond or the trust itself buying the bond. And that really comes down to what you want to do in the future and asset protection. Right. Is that the analysis? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so um, part of it's tax, but I think also part of it is that sort of estate planning and how is it you want to transfer wealth through to that next generation. Uh, and that's quite important because if you burden uh, quite a young person with a significant amount of wealth, whilst they'll probably think it's Christmas, you'll most likely destroy their life skills. Um, they'll uh, normally blow the capital because they're not used to managing it. They'll live a lifestyle well beyond what they can afford. They'll attract friends that aren't really friends. And over a 10-year period, the capital will probably deplete. They haven't built the life skills that most of us would build through that period. And they're normally in the worst position. So you want to put some tools in place that uh, will let them step up at a sort of a trustee level, see how the capital is managed and go, oh, wow, if I can just keep this capital there, look at all the income it throws out every year. And then after a period of time, they become better managers of the family capital and they see themselves more of a custodian to then pass it through to their next generation as opposed to getting it too young without the education or getting it too young without the education and it normally sort of disappears. So for us, we use bonds in a whole range of things. But in terms of the family trust, um, one of the advantages is obviously that um, that tax advantage of, of not having the beneficiaries at 30%. Uh, at the individual level, they open up all sorts of um, great and wonderful strategies, as we talked about. Um, they're a great sort of savings vehicle for education. So a child is born, we always make sure our clients put a little bit aside, remember controlling that cash flow. Yes. Um, and uh, so by the time they're private education, if they are going to do private education, it's all fully funded. And they're pulling it out after the 10 years, so there's no tax to pay on the money that's coming out fully funds the private education. Fingers crossed we've got their cash flow working, consolidated revenue funds private education and the bond keeps rolling. Yes. And then it becomes a deposit into property for the child when they're 2025. 20, uh, and the way that property prices are going, that's probably a better outcome. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so just let me to tease that out for a moment. So that's effectively saying when my child's born, I take some cash flow out of the business or out of the family trust or elsewhere out of the family and set it aside or over the 10 years potentially, we're using the 125% rule, and use that to fund education, which I guess helps with cash flow too, because mm. um, you know, I only had one boy at private school, but by the time he was in year 12, it mm. was 34 grand a year. Mm. Yeah, 11 grand in year seven looked okay. 34 in year 12 starts to look a bit... Yeah, so if you've got 50,000 a year, six years, 300... And you've got three kids, that's 900. Um, if you're not provisioning, remember we talked about having clarity around all the pots? If you're not provisioning for that, you're going to have to find that. So that's okay. You, you get to that point and you're going to have to pull that money at that time, but that means maybe you won't be able to save or pay down debt. So we like to get ahead of it. We say, okay, that's the cost that you you may incur. Why don't we start provisioning for it and start to build it? Because normally the earlier you build it, you get the magic of compound returns and, and off we go. So we love that because it's just a great savings mechanism. You put it aside. We love the 125% because it's forced savings. So it forces them to see if they start at $500 a month and it goes to 625 or whatever it is and it just keeps building automatically. And anything that builds savings, we always find um, clients get better off because we talk about them living a magnificent life. Part of that is pushing them. Mm-hmm. We find that by starting to pull some money out of the business or some more savings from their salary, they tend to push themselves a little bit more. It just drives, it, it almost helps drive the business to mm-hmm. see what they're capable of and it throws out even more cash. You capture more cash and it becomes this sort of self-fulfilling type thing. So yeah, so on the individual level, savings for education, that works really, really well. Anything beyond a 10-year horizon, the tax rules within those bonds works absolutely fabulously. And as we mentioned, it, it's also got those benefits from the estate planning point of view. So we'll normally do quite um, work with a family solicitor and their accountant in terms of quite complex estate planning because there's normally family trust, self managed super funds, individuals, the whole works. So the transferring of that through to the next generation, you want to make sure you get right because as we talked about, otherwise it might be a bit detrimental. You leave behind some big CGT problems for the second generation. That's right. Generation. Yeah, yeah. So whilst we don't have death duties, there's definitely some hidden yeah. taxes. And, and as you'll be aware, the superannuation has some pretty hidden taxes in there as well. So you want to get their whole estate planning uh, really I think well the moral is that you've got to die before your kids turn 25. <laughs> That's right. And uh, so managing all of that is really important. And it's just the bonds just give you some flexibility that, um, one, there's some good asset protection and tax while you're alive, but they can also just dovetail really nicely into quite a, a broad estate planning strategy. So we because we, we're strategy-based, we love anything that gives us great strategy. We love it from the forced savings, 25% increase every year. We love it from the asset protection, the estate planning. It really does tick a lot of boxes. And they're starting to get more fun flow into them, we're finding. And so uh, just like everything, the more fun that flows into them, the more efficient they become, the more options are available in there. 
uh, and it just sort of just tends to get there. So with those child, well, I would almost call it child endowment, the way you're setting them up for you know, education plus potentially home deposit, how do you set those up? Do you, do you have the child as the... So the uh, well, so Generation Life had, had two. Um, they had a child builder bond, mm -hmm. and then they, they had the normal bond. The child builder bond matures at 25. So, so you've got full control of it, um, but if the child gets to 25, then they take ownership of the bond and off they go. Now, because you've got the future transfer event, you don't really need the child builder mm -hmm. bond. You can just put the future transfer event at 20, uh, 25. So within the bond, you'll have the life insured. And then you'll have the nominated beneficiary. So, so the life insured would be the child? So the life insured is normally the parents. Oh, the parents. You can nominate your, your grandparents if you like, if you, if you want to try and trigger the yeah. tax rate. But normally we've seen it is the parents. And uh, and then if one parent dies, the bond keeps going. If both parents die, then it reverts through to um, the child. But you'd normally have a future transfer event at sort of 18 and 25. Uh, so the child would normally be the beneficiary and the parents would normally be the life insured. Because the advantage of that then is the income until the child turns 18 is sheltered from the excess tax for minors and they receive the money without triggering a tax event at the time. Yeah. And in the meantime, it's not assets of the parent for asset protection purposes. Correct. It's really good. And from a, um, from a control point of view, uh, the parents still have full access to that money. So whilst it's there and the aim is to, be, to, to fund the children's education or eventually maybe to give to the children, say, at age 25... Up until the twenty, you know, the child's twenty-four and eleven months and whatever, twenty-nine days, the parents can pull that money back to themselves anytime they want. So it gives gives them the the advantage of the strategy and the tax and the asset protection, but with the flexibility that if they need money from a liquidity point of view, because I don't know about you, but I know that if our families have uh, financial stress, comes from lack of liquidity. So we can have a twenty or a thirty million dollar family if it's all tied up in capital that's not liquid they will feel financial stress. Yeah. So we're always big on, and part of that's part of the reason why the fund's grown so quickly is we always make sure they have liquidity pots. So either portfolio assets that can be liquidated really quick, that has its own complication because they can be liquidated quick and you've got to be able to manage volatility, uh, particularly for family business clients who are used to cash and property. Like to them, that's that's nice yep. and stable because it's not priced on a daily basis, the property, so it seems really nice and stable. Yeah, well, as I keep reminding our, our members that just because you stop measuring it every day doesn't mean it goes away. So with those child ones, are you taking the money out of the family trust so it's non-trust money that's used? For the child builder bonds, traditionally from, from when we're advising families, that's money that's outside of the whole structure. Mm -hmm. So it's either come to them as a salary, as a dividend, or some sort of income that's come to them. So we'll normally pick up the after-tax cash mm -hmm. and use that as instead of sort of going into the lifestyle, because we've got lifestyle fully funded, uh, this is left over and it goes into into that world. Michael Bova, thank you very much for joining us at the XY Podcast. That was Michael Bova from Family Wealth Advisory in Sydney. From what both Les and Michael have shared from their experience, I think it is clear that innovation is alive and well in financial services and nowhere more so than in advisors helping a diverse range of clients with their investment and income stream offerings. When we return in the next episode, I'll be chatting to Grant Hackett and Philippe Arujo from our sponsor Genlife to learn more about how their investment bond and annuity products can fit into your practice and how they can help you quickly gain the knowledge to effectively use these products with your clients. I'm Vince Scully and you've been listening to the XY Advisor podcast. Till next time, bye for now.